Well, what a strange and unusual week it has been with both a snowstorm and this terrible polar vortex that's descended on us. I'm glad that you are here. I hope that you are reasonably warm in the pews today, and I pray that you and your family did not suffer any hardships for the cold. But as you may know, the cold has provided a lot to worry about this week. People's pipes have been freezing up and overtaxed furnaces have been breaking down. Our pillars, family, shelter, formerly homeless connections lost power and the pipes burst and the building flooded and everyone had to be evacuated to a local church. This has been a crazy, dangerous, and concerning week, to say the least. So what a seasonal mismatch to hear Jesus' words today. I mean, how are we really to hear, do not worry, in a world so full of worries? A well-known scholar from Harvard preached on this passage at an exclusive girls' school in Manhattan. He thought that Jesus' words might help to calm the ranks of the anxious overachievers who can be found among the elite scholars. It seemed that the sermon had gone well, but afterwards, at the reception, a father of one of the girls came over with fire in his eyes and ice in his voice and said to this scholar, This is a load of nonsense. The scholar replied, well, Jesus said it. It is still nonsense, he said. He was not dissuaded by an appeal to scripture. It was anxiety that got my daughter into this school. It was anxiety that has kept her here. And it's anxiety that's going to take her to Yale. And it will be anxiety that will keep her in Yale. And it will be anxiety that will get her a good job. You are just selling a bunch of nonsense to these kids today. Well, perhaps, especially after this week of terrible cold, maybe we can agree or resonate with this father in some way. You know, life has real concerns. There are real worries, real hardships which weigh heavy upon us, and where the directive to do not worry seems absurd, it seems glib, lacking even a grain of compassion. But Jesus, Jesus was not glib. Jesus was not an absurd person. Jesus was not a person who lacked compassion. He sought out those who suffered, were in pain, He spoke out against the powerful who ignored ignored their cries. Jesus knew his life was of great consequence and he felt this weight every day for he even asked his father, take this cup from me. And yet, through hardship and in wisdom, Jesus says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. This past summer, a friend Dave and I ventured into the Boundary Waters for a week-long canoe trip. On our first day, it dawned with a bluebird sky and a light breeze, and we arrived at our first portage. I hoisted the canoe above my head and began moving through a hot, thickly forested path. As one always does when carrying gear over terrain, my eyes were trained on the ground right in front of me, trying to avoid rolling an ankle or taking a fall. We descended down a rocky hill. We dumped our gear at the edge of a crystal clear lake, and we turned around and headed back, unencumbered this time. We did not have a heavy canoe. There were no packs, no paddles, no life jackets, just us looking about. At the top of the hill, right next to the path, a scarlet color began to catch our attention. Now, red is not something you see much of in the Boundary Waters. And as I drew closer, I saw that it was a flower, a perfectly formed and beautiful lily. Without me mentioning it, Dave also saw this beautiful flower, and we both took out our cameras and put them in macro mode and took pictures right up next to it, sort of absorbing its beauty. I included one of the pictures I took in your bulletin after the worship section. 
It must be some kind of lily. It looks so beautiful. It looks fake, like somebody planted it here, I said out loud. After a time of silence and just taking in this marvelous wonder, Dave said, I wonder what the lily is trying to tell us, Nick. Maybe it's reminding us that we need to stop and smell the roses on this sabbatical, because sabbaticals don't come very often. Agreed, I responded. Strangely, you know, when, when Dave and I stopped to pause and to consider the small flower's beauty, we began to breathe in something, something different and something precious. And that moment changed the trajectory of our entire week canoeing together. We then chose to enter into long stretches of silence. We even chose an entire day of silence where we stayed in one spot, sitting at the edge of a lake in camp, watching the water's edge as a giant lumbering snapping turtle poked its head up and looked at us, its golden metallic eyes, wondering what we were doing in its place. And with all that silence, and with choosing to be there in that moment, we were enamored with the wealth of life that surrounded us, birds circling, fish cruising by. And you know, Dave and I, we're both pastors. We're husbands, we're fathers, we're sons. And we came on that trip with all of the weighty concerns you think that we would with those roles in life. Our conversations were full of the struggle to be faithful. We felt guilty that our wives were at home with children. We're just out here being restored. We carried all these anxieties with us. They were real. And yet, Jesus says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like a one of these. You know, Jesus is not some sort of dreamy poet in this scripture. Jesus is a prophet, and more in the scripture, he's preaching a sermon. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount that is meant to be taken seriously. His words call us not to erase or ignore the weight of our concerns, but to stop, to stop and peer into God's kingdom, to trust in God's beautiful goodness, to witness the divine hand of providence tending to God's good garden, and to connect with some sort of ultimate meaning. New Testament scholar Robert Tannehill reminds us that the verb katamanthenao means to look and to consider, but it is an extremely strong verb. Jesus does not ask merely for a glance or some sort of gentle mauling over if you have the time. This is a command. It is in the command form. Jesus commands that we stop, consider, look, Think about what we are gazing upon around us in our lives. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like a one of these. Do you know our lilies, the lilies in our lives, are many. God has intentionally planted beauty in our lives just for beauty's sake to bespeak God's goodness. And they are not just plants. They are people. They are places. They are moments pregnant with grace that nourish us and help us to be whole. So where are the lilies in your life? Do you stop to consider them? Stop! Consider, breathe in their glory and their beauty. Hear the sounds that lift you high through music. Witness God's grandeur in creation. How will you stop and deeply consider this innate goodness 
And through this, marvel at God's fantastic and otherworldly and beautiful love. Now, in the first service, what I'm about to say caused a ruckus. You may not know that daffodils are lilies, but we had half a dozen people on their smartphones confirming my claim <laughs> that a daffodil is a kind of lily. And you may not know that the yellow daffodil is probably the most common lily that we see in the world. I have some on the communion table. They are beautiful and lovely and iconic. Botanist Marta McDowell writes about their origin, which has recently been called into question. There's this new theory that suggests these lilies are really not native to Europe. Rather, it was the Romans who took the ancestors of these lilies and spread them across uh, the Mediterranean and up through their empire as it grew. Now, if this is true, the ancient Romans would have never known how they began to propagate the beginning of a thousand variations of size and color and smell that would become the daffodil that we know, which is a worldwide symbol of springtime beauty and warmth. So too are we. So do we. We unknowingly participate in the sowing of God's beauty in all that we do. We too, who ladle soup to the hungry, we too, who visit the sick, we too, who clothe the naked, we too, who give shelter to the homeless, we too, propagate the most beautiful and enduring lily the world has ever seen, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the love of God. You, you are a lily. God made you fantastically unique, surprisingly beautiful. You too, stop, consider all the lilies that God has planted around us. God has planted so many lilies. You are standing in an endless field of them. Sometimes you receive their gift of beauty and glimpse God's eternal wealth of love and artistry. And sometimes you are the one passing them along so that someone else might be filled with promise and with hope and to forge a stronger tie to the one gardener who takes delight in our very beautiful beings just for who we are, however fleeting they are, however momentary they may seem. The love of God endures. Beauty will never end. So may we stop. Stop and consider long enough, gaze fervently enough, such that confidence and faith would give us the courage to hold God's promises tightly as we seek to be disciples amidst all of the worries of today and to trust that tomorrow, tomorrow, God will tend to us, the one gardener will tend to us, and those worries in due time. Amen.